God is not finished with you yet. Aren't you glad for that? God is not finished yet. He's not finished with this church. He's not finished with your life. He's not finished with your story. There are things that God wants to do still with you. Even if you've blown it in the past, God is not finished with you yet. There are some things that God has for us in the future that are going to be wonderful things, and we need to see that what God did here on this 50th day, it shows us that he's not finished with us yet, he's not finished with the church yet, and he's not finished doing the things that he does. And I'm very excited about this. So we're going to pick up in Acts chapter 2, and we're going to read verses 1 through 4. And once again, this was the 50th day, which was the day of Pentecost. I'll explain what that means in just a minute. Verse number one, when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together talking about the disciples and so forth. They were all together in one place and suddenly, aren't you glad that God is a God of suddenly? You're just going along, things sometimes don't seem right, things sometimes seem hopeless, and suddenly God shows up. Aren't you glad that God, even though it says suddenly he does these things, he's never late. He's never too early. He's always on time. God suddenly began to work in the church. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. I want to give you just three thoughts from this text today that will show us how God's not finished with us. He's not finished working in our lives. He's not finished with the church. Here's the first thing I want you to see. God is not finished keeping his promises. In other words, promises that he made a long time ago, he is going to fulfill. Promises that he's made to us today, he is going to fulfill. God is not finished keeping his promises. Now, I want you to notice that phrase, when the day of Pentecost arrives. arrived. Now, Pentecost was an Old Testament celebration of the giving of the law. Now, I'm going to explain that to you, and this is going to be, uh, I think, a, a scary word for some people. We hear the word Pentecost, we think of the word Pentecostals. How many came from a Pentecostal or charismatic background? Let me see your hand. All right, a lot of you. Some of you probably were like me, from a Baptist background. The first time I was ever around anyone that spoke in tongues or had a Pentecostal background, it just about freaked me out. I didn't know what in the world was going on. And so to me, for a long time, uh, the word Pentecost was a scary word. It was a scary word because I knew people that were a little strange that were Pentecostal, okay? And uh, let me tell you what the word Pentecost means, okay? This is going to be scary, and it's going to rock your world. It means 50, Ooh, that's a scary word, isn't it? It means 50. The word penta, all right, five, cost it to the 10th power. It's 50 is all it means. And where that comes from is in the Old Testament when after the Passover, 50 days after the Passover, uh, the giving of the law of God, it came there uh, to Moses. Now, let me kind of set this up for you so you understand it. Um, the Passover comes from when the children of Israel, remember they had been enslaved in Egypt for a long time. They'd been in Egypt for over 400 years. They'd been enslaved for a while, not the entire time. But uh, God sent Moses to Pharaoh. And you remember what he said? Let my people go. God wanted his people to be released and freed. And what did Pharaoh do? He said no. And in fact, he said no a lot of times. And so what did God do? Well, he sent plagues so that it would convince Pharaoh that he actually did need to let God's people go and to worship him. And so the first of those 10 plagues 
Anybody remember? It was turning water to blood. That would be a scary thing. Well, the 10th and final, one of the plagues was the death of the firstborn. Not just firstborn sons, not just the firstborn children, but the firstborn of all their cattle, their animals, everything, the death of all the firstborn. Now, what the word Passover comes from was what God told Moses to tell the Israelites. He said, you need to slaughter, slay, kill, whatever word you want to use, an innocent lamb, a perfect lamb, one without blemish, and you need to take the blood of that lamb and apply it to the door, the top of the door, and on the sides of the door. Anybody figure out what that looks like? It looks like a cross, right? And so Jesus, of course, was the Lamb of God, and he was God's perfect Lamb. There was no uh, fault found in him. And so obviously this represented one day that Jesus would die on a cross for our sins, the Passover. But where the word Passover comes from was when God told them, he said, take the blood of this innocent lamb and put it on the doorpost and, and the top of the door. He said, and when I, talked about the death angel, he said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. That's where the word Passover comes from. And so what it represents, of course, is that Jesus Christ died for our sins and that his blood was shed so that we could be redeemed, we could be forgiven, we could be bought back, ransomed back by God through the blood of his only innocent, perfect son, Jesus Christ. And then what happened was, after the Israelites were released and let go, uh, 50 days later, the coming of the law happened, okay? The God gave the law. Now, we know from the Bible that the law represents death because no one can keep the law fully. Only Jesus, Jesus is the only human that ever did. The Bible tells us that Jesus did not come to abolish the law but to fulfill it. And the reason that he did that was because as our representative, as a human, he fulfilled the requirements of the law for us. He fulfilled the requirements of being perfect. He never broke one single law. He never sinned once. And as our representative, as a human, he was able to die in our place as a human. But he also, we know, was God. And God, in human form lived a perfect, sinless life, and he was fully human. But as God and the Son of God, he also was able to die as God to pay the penalty for our sin because God could not be a just God if he did not punish sin. But as a loving God, he wanted to give us a second chance. He wanted to give us a way, a pathway back to God. And that pathway is not, it is not being a good person. It is not being a moral person. The, the giving of the law was not given to us to show us how to be perfect in the eyes of God. It was given to show us that it is impossible for us to be perfect in the eyes of God. And so what God did was he made a promise. And that promise goes way back earlier than when Moses was here. In fact, it started in the Garden of Eden. Do you remember the story? Uh, God created a perfect world. The Bible tells us in Genesis that everything that he did at the end of those six days of creation, it says, and God saw that it was good. Nothing sinful about it. No flaws in it. It was perfect. And he created Adam and Eve in his image. And of course, we know the story. They sinned. They chose to disobey God because the devil tempted them. He showed them. He said, if you will eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you'll be like God. And in their pride, they gave in to that temptation. And as a result, the Bible tells us that sin entered into the world. And that's why Jesus needed to be our Savior. That's why he needed to come. Because in that story, the Bible shows us 
that God said to serpent, the, the serpent, that was Satan, okay? It says uh, that I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. Well, we know that women do not have the seed, they have the egg. And so that was a reference to the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. And God said, you will bruise his heel. And he did. When Jesus was here on this earth, he tempted Jesus, or Satan tempted Jesus. And when it came time for Jesus to die, no one took his life. The Bible says he willingly laid it down for us. But can you imagine how the devil felt that he had scored a victory when Jesus died? He bruised his heel. But thank God, three days later, he got up out of the grave and he crushed Satan's head. That promise was given to us before the law was ever given. So God's picture of grace was given far before the law was ever given. So God's still keeping his promises. But I want to show you that, and you may not have noticed this before, but uh, in the book of Leviticus, uh, we see that when God gave the law, that uh, the word Pentecost, which means 50, it was given on uh, a Friday, a Friday. Now, if you're a mathematician and you add up the days after the death of Jesus, something had to change. Otherwise, it would not have been on a Sunday when Jesus resurrected. It would have been on a Friday when Jesus was crucified. But that would not have fit the promises that God had made. So I want you to read with me in Leviticus chapter 23, verses 15 and 16. He says, this is God speaking. He said, you shall count seven full weeks, that's 49 days, from the day after the Sabbath. Now, if you know about Jewish culture, you know that the Sabbath is not on a Sunday. It's on a Saturday. So that would be 49 days plus one, which equals 50, which means that it would happen on a Sunday, that they would celebrate the day of Pentecost on a Sunday, the day that Jesus resurrected. It's almost like God knew something special was going to happen. It's almost like God knew that his son was going to be the fulfillment of these promises and that on a Sunday, he would resurrect from the grave and everything was changed. By the way, when you look at these comparisons, when God gave the law at Pentecost originally in the Old Testament, you know what happened? There was a, a mighty sound from heaven and there was the giving of the law and 3,000 people were killed because of their sin. 3,000 people were killed because of their sin. But when the Holy Spirit came, not the law, but the Holy Spirit, which represents God's grace in our lives, at the day of Pentecost, 50 days after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, there was also a great sound from heaven. The Holy Spirit descended, and 3,000 people weren't killed on that day, but 3,000 people received Christ on that day and were given eternal life. <laughs> Praise God. You see the difference that the law brings death. But thank God Jesus Christ brings life. And Jesus, it was said about him that the law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. What does that mean? Well, it means that God has not finished keeping his promises. He made those promises before the law was ever given. He made those promises in the Garden of Eden. He made them to uh, Noah. He made them to Adam and Eve. He made them to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob. He, he gave those promises to David. He gave those promises to us. It was fulfilled on the day of Pentecost in the New Testament. And the point is this. Don't miss this. He's still keeping his promises today. Because what started on that day of Pentecost when the church started, he is still doing today. He's doing it here in our town. He's doing it in our state. Every day, people are receiving Christ. They're being added to the church. He's doing it in our nation. 
He's doing it across the world. Did you know that some of the places where the move of God is the greatest on the planet right now, it's not in what we would think of as Christian or Western nations, but it's in places like Afghanistan. It's places like Iran and Iraq. Did you know that the church is growing, that more people are being saved in Iraq and Iran and Afghanistan than in any place in the world right now? They're leaving that false religion of Islam. They're leaving that, uh, that thing that brings curses in our life, which is a works-based approach to God, and they're turning to Jesus Christ literally by the millions. By the millions. And, and here's the point. He's not finished keeping his promises. He's not finished keeping his promises to you. That's why you need to pray for family to be saved. That's why you need to pray for coworkers and friends and neighbors to come to Christ. That's why you need to pray that God would continue to fulfill his promise. Why? He's not finished fulfilling his promises yet. He's going to keep on and keep on and keep on. He's promised to keep you. He's promised to be with you. He's promised to provide for you. And God is not finished with you yet. Thank God. He's not finished keeping his promises. Here's the second thing I want you to see. God is not finished loving his people. Man, aren't you glad for that? Aren't you glad that God is not finished loving you. The Bible shows us that God demonstrated his love to his people when the Holy Spirit came. There in the book of Acts, the story we just read. It was accompanied by tongues of fire and speaking in tongues. Now, in this particular uh, story, in this particular instant, uh, the, the gift of tongues or the miracle of tongues was a miracle of people understanding in their own language. Now, other places in the Bible, it's a little different than that, including a prayer language in other places. But what, show, what I believe this shows us is a contrast between what God wants to do in his church today, loving his people, and in the Old Testament, there was a story that maybe you're familiar with. It's called the Tower of Babel. Anybody ever heard that story? It's where God confused the languages and brought judgment because of people's sin. I want to just show you some comparisons Uh, to the Tower of Babel, and to the day of Pentecost in the book of Acts. In Genesis chapter 11, the Tower of Babel represents judgment for sin. Why? Because people had rejected God. God brought judgment. What had happened at the Tower of Babel, they gathered together, and they said, we're going to build a tower to the heavens. You know what that means? It means based on their own goodness, their own works, their own idea of how good they were, that they were going to approach God on their own, on their own terms. And God says, that's not the way it works. You'll never get to God by trying to build your own way there. You'll never get to God through your own works. It is only through the mercy of God that we see in the book of Acts. In the Tower of Babel, what happened, God said, hey, uh, these people, uh, they can do anything In one language, in unity, they can do anything that their mind, they set their mind to. And so what God did was he confused the languages and he scattered them. He scattered them. Uh, Tower of Babel represents judgment for their sin. All nations were represented. It's interesting. You read the story, Genesis 11. Every nation was represented. Uh, Discord and confusion. The word Babel actually means confused. So God confused them. And the thing that they worshiped there was not God, but themselves. They worshiped themselves. And they tried to build a tower to heaven. That's works-based approach to God. But I want you to contrast that with uh, the the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. That day did not represent judgment. It represented love. God pouring out his love on humanity through what Jesus Christ did and the coming of the Holy Spirit. By the way, all nations were represented, Acts 2, verse 5. Every nation under heaven is what it says. So all people were represented. Uh, It says that they were unified. They were in one accord there, and they had clarity. It was not confusion, 
but clarity. And they did not worship themselves. Rather, they worshiped God. And it was not based on their works. It was not based on what they could build, but rather it was based on the grace of God and how he brought them into relationship with him. You see, God is not finished loving his people. I love this in Zephaniah chapter 3. That's a, an Old Testament prophet, Zephaniah. And he wrote, For then I will restore to the people a pure language that they may all call on the name of the Lord. Do you see the parallel there? That, that pure language, or in other words, that, that, that speaking of tongues that came uh, on the day of Pentecost. And it says that everyone can call upon the name of the Lord Uh, The Bible tells us in the book of Romans, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. God was pouring out his grace. God was pouring out his mercy. God was saving people that would call on him. And it says that they would serve him with one accord. That is what the church is supposed to be like. The church is supposed to be in one accord. Um, and, and, And by the way, God wants the church to be in unity. Not uniformity. Uniformity leads to cults. Uniformity is that everybody has to dress the same, look the same, wear their hair the same, uh, speak the same. It, that that kind of leads to cultish behavior. But unity is the unification around a cause. In this case, around a person in Jesus Christ. God brings unity to the church, and when that happens, he pours out his love on the world. John 3, 16 and 17, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. I've got good news for you, friend. God's not finished loving his people. He started it in the Garden of Eden. He started with a promise that one day a Savior would come. He kept on reiterating that promise throughout Scripture, throughout the Old Testament. And one day Jesus, his son, left heaven, was born of a virgin, and lived a perfect life, and he died in our place on the cross. Died a death that we should have died. And he was put in a real tomb, a real grave. And he was really, truly dead. But we know the rest of that story, don't we? After three days, he got up out of that grave, not only to demonstrate that he has power over sin and death, but to show his love for us. Ephesians chapter 2, one of my favorite passages talking about what God will do for us throughout eternity. If you think that we're going to sit around on a cloud strumming a harp throughout all of eternity, you don't have a scriptural view of what heaven's going to be like. And I'm glad it's not like that because I don't really like harp music and I don't know about sitting on a cloud, all right? Uh, you know, I mean, I, I guess I would, wouldn't mind trying sitting on a cloud, but I wouldn't want to sit there the rest of my life, throughout eternity especially. Can you imagine listening to harp music throughout all of eternity? I mean, I, I just got to be honest with you. I got to have a little variety in there. I mean, harp's okay, I guess, for a second, my wife majored in piano pedagogy in college. She's a tremendous musician. She teaches classical piano. She loves classical music. She loves other styles of music as well. And um, I, throughout my years of knowing her, when we were dating, I took her to a classical orchestra thing, whatever you call it, concert, all right? And um, I loved pretending that I liked that music in front of her. I took her to an opera one time. I could not have been more confused. I, I got to be honest. And I'm an educated man, okay? But I kept asking my wife, what are they doing? Why are they doing that? Because they would come out and like, you know, they were supposed to be fighting and they would come out and do a bunch of up on the toe stuff and then they wouldn't fight. And I'm like, this is the lamest fight I've ever seen in my life. Well, we're not going to be sitting on clouds. I want you to listen to what God is going to do for us throughout eternity. It says, but God, 
being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him. In other words, when you get saved, it's like you're already there. He said he raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages, you could insert the word eternity there, so that in eternity, forever and ever, never ending, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and it is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast, for we are his workmanship. Some translations read, masterpiece, masterpiece. Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared before him that we should walk in them. What does that mean? Well, God's not finished loving you yet. He's going to pour out his grace and just impress you and show off throughout all of eternity. Can you imagine that? I mean, it's going to be like, what do you think about that? Oh, here's something. What do you think about that? It's just like throughout all of eternity, he's going to remind us of how awesome Jesus is, of how great he is, of how much he loves us. And the Bible says, oh, by the way, he made you to be his masterpiece. I don't know if you've ever had a masterpiece or not, or something that you greatly treasure. I mean, that's so valuable that no amount of money would ever, you would ever take for it. But God says that's how he looks at you that you are his masterpiece. That when you feel that you're not worthy of his love, you're right. You're not. Neither am I. But that's what's so amazing about his grace is that in spite of it all, he loves us. In spite of it all, he says, that's my masterpiece. That's my pride and joy. That's what I'm most happy that I have. Isn't that amazing to think about that that's how God feels toward you? He's not finished loving his people. And then finally, God is not finished fulfilling his purpose. God has an overriding, overarching purpose for our lives. And that is that we bring people into his family. We make disciples. Acts 2, 41 to 43, just after the text that we read in the opening part, talking about those people that got saved on that day and the church as it grew. It says, so those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayers, and all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. In these verses, we see how God used the church to fulfill his purpose. And by the way, and I'm, this is kind of another sermon, so I'm going to just give you what the purposes are for us. Evangelism, he's not finished using you to invite people to come to Jesus. That's why we say inviting is evangelism here at Avalon Church. He's not finished, his purpose is discipleship. He's not finished growing you. Uh, You may be going through difficult times. Maybe you're going through a bump in the road, but he has not finished growing you. Uh, They had ministry there in the text we just read. He's not finished using you to serve. You may have been on the sidelines for a while. It's time for you to get back in the game. Why? He's not finished using you. He's not finished with you yet. Uh, They had fellowship. He's not finished using you in the church. He's not finished connecting you. He doesn't want you to be alone. He wants you to be with his people. And then one of the greatest things we see in the verses we just read was worship. It said, great awe came on all of them. He is not finished revealing himself to you. Aren't you glad about that? I have people all the time asking me. In fact, today before the service, I had someone ask me, how do you know when God's speaking to you? Well, you'll know. Obviously, you, you compare that with Scripture. And, uh, but in a worship service, you know what I love? God speaks. Now, some of you are more into the expression than others, okay? Some of you like to raise your hands. 
Some of you have been around church long enough that you know what that looks like, but you worship like this. You put your hands in your pocket, and I get that. I, I was never a hand raiser a long time ago, but then you know what I did after a while? Took my hands out of my pocket, and I started like tapping my sides a little bit, and then I started, when nobody was looking, just kind of raising my hand like that, you know what I mean? All right. And I was like, oh, God, you know. And then after a while, I got enough nerve to raise one hand. I don't know why you would raise one hand rather than two, but that's what I did. And then finally, I was like, thank God for who he is and great awe came on me. I've got some good news for you. God's not finished with you yet. He's not finished loving you. He's not finished keeping his promises. and He's not finished using you if you just let him. And that's my prayer for you today, that you would let him use you. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would help us to allow you to work through us, to reveal yourself to us, to use us. Thank you for these beautiful pictures you give us in the Bible. Show us exactly what you want. Lord, I pray for people today that may be watching online or in the room that need to be saved. I pray that you'd save them today. I pray for those that are in the room or watching online today that you spoke to them about something. Help them to follow you. And Lord, I thank you for what you're doing in this place. In Jesus' name. Thanks for joining us at Avalon Church. Share this message with a friend and make sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single video. You can also join us every Sunday live on the Avalon Church Facebook page. If you feel led to give and support our mission of bringing people wherever they are into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ, you can do so by clicking the Give button. Thanks again for joining us. We'll see you next time.